now uh, it is a pleasure to uh, to have the, the, the opportunity to interview Halel um, uh, Svandiari today um, on this very hot item nowadays okay the power of Iranian women and um, the way you know uh, the, the protests and the movement have you know uh, raised awareness uh, all over the world uh, this uh, uh, this topic was raised by Claire Agassipur uh, from the board of the uh, theater the Netherlands thank you so much for that um, and she will be uh, uh, interviewing uh, Halel today um, without much ado, uh, introduce Anel and have a pleasant interview, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Julia, and indeed, welcome everybody. It is uh, our pleasure today to be talking with Halea Svandiori about this very topical subject of the extraordinary women's protest movement in Iran and uh, as well as talking about the history of Iranian women in the last uh, century. So we uh, thank you, Hale, for, for joining us from Washington, D.C. today. I know you have lots of interviews about this subject everywhere. Uh, Dr. Hale Svandiyadi is uh, an Iranian by birth, and she grew up there. And uh, after her studies, she was in Iran a journalist, and she was also the deputy secretary general for the women's movement of Iran, as well as being the uh, deputy director of the Queen's Shahbanu Farah Foundation with responsibilities for culture and museums. After the revolution, uh, Dr. Svandiyori moved to America to the Princeton University where she taught Pers the Persian language. And after a number of years, she then went to Washington DC where she founded the Middle Eastern program for the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars. And that is where she is today as well as uh, a distinguished fellow and the director. We're very happy that you're with us today, particularly as in 2006, when you went back to Iran, you were unceremoniously arrested and uh, we will talk about that period later. You were arrested and you were put in uh, solitary confinement for 105 days, um, which you recounted in your book, My Prison, My Home. And that is one of your publications. You've also produced another uh, wonderfully insightful book about the women of Iran called Restructured Lives. And we will talk about all of that. So uh, again, thanks a lot for being here. For those of us who might want uh, to know a bit more, can you please straight off take us into what has been happening in Iran since the start of these demonstrations eight weeks ago? <clears throat> Uh, Claire, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Sitar, and of course, Steve, who is in the background and we didn't see him. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I already heard from a close friend of mine who was, I think, the former president of Sitar, Parin Namazi. She just sent the Q&A. Uh, welcome me. Um, now, um, it's an honor to be here, of course, and taking you to what is happening to in Iran. Um, on September 13, an ordinary day for everybody who was living in Iran, a young woman from the city of Sartez in Iranian Kurdistan 
was vis visiting her family in Tehran. She was stopped outside the metro uh, station and by the morality police and was told that uh, her attire is not uh, proper and she is showing too much hair. So she probably must have replied to them that look, it's, I'm okay, I'm dressed okay and discovers my hair, etc. So the morality police insisted of taking her to their headquarters. Her brother was with her and he tried to intervene, but with, uh, he didn't succeed. So they put her in the van and we just don't know what happened in the van. Apparently, according to stories, they started beating her and they were smashing you know, her head with either a baton or hitting her head against the wall. Anyway, once she, uh, they arrived at the um, headquarters of the morality police, um, it took three hours that, and then she must have gotten some more beating there. She collapsed. They took her to the hospital. According to the hospital report, she was brain, brain dead upon arrival. They, they tried to resuscitate her for uh, two days, but on the 16th, they announced she was dead. By then, her family was outside the hospital and, uh, you know, there was a journalist there too who just uh, printed the story. And that triggered a protest movement, the like of it we have not seen ever in Iran. First of all, women came out into the street because they thought this could have happened to them too, young girls. And these uh, girls are referred to as the Gen Z generation, you know? So they, start, they started day after day coming out, removing their headscarves, burning them sometimes in public. And uh, at that point, the president of Iran, I think who happened to be in the US and been back, went back to Iran, not because of this, but the end of his trip, and I called the family and said, they will look into that to see really what happened. To this day, we haven't heard what, ha what happened. It read the, real, the truth. We heard all sorts of lies and so on. Since then, I mean, we are now in the eighth week of these demonstrations, day after day, night after night, especially at night, young people come out into the street uh, and demonstrate. And uh, the first they would say, woman, freedom, life. You know, later on they added justice, liberty, and uh, end to voluntary, uh, and justice, sorry, justice, liberty, voluntary hijab. And, uh, you know, gradually the demonstration spread into a lot of cities, I think 40 or 50 cities across Iran. And um, the security people had, were sent out on the street to disperse the demonstrators and they used uh, water cannon, a water cannon and they used, they started then using firearms. And, you know, since then, 300 young people have been killed. Several thousand were arrested and uh, the demonstrations are going on. So it's actually, it's all over Iran now, from north to south, from east to west, and, and demonstrators are coming out expectedly and unexpectedly everywhere. Is that right? Sure. They, they have been mostly coming out at night because it's not easy to detect them. 
and um, they, they are among you see now demonstrators from all walk of life uh, joining these women but really the leadership there is no known leadership there are but it is the women's movement it's the a revolution i think by the women for the women you know, that is what is what makes it so different, you know. And if you look back, Claire, the first group that came out and protested in the Islamic Republic were women. 43 years ago, after the establishment of the Islamic Republic, the hijab was made mandatory. And that came as a shock to all women, you know, because they didn't expect this. Before the revolution, you could, you were free to observe the hijab or you were left alone not to observe it, you know. So a lot of women were not used to being told what to wear, how to cover themselves and so. So it's interesting to see that 43 years later, the young women are fighting for the same cause that the middle class women of 40, 43 years ago, after the establishment of the Islamic Republic, were fighting for. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's like a sort of history. The, the, the spirit of women in Iran, what is called Shirzan, which is lion women in Iranian uh, uh, literature. It's alive, it's certainly alive and kicking. And because uh, the Iranian, because of the, the Islamic Revolution, Republic of Iran has been there for the last uh, 44 years almost now. It's, uh, it may be that some of our audience members actually only know Iran through them. But of course, before the Islamic Revolution, uh, from 1925 to 1979, uh, there were two kings who ruled Iran, Reza Shah and his son Mohammad Reza Shah. So you're now touching on uh, women uh, before uh, the revolution. So can you please give us a bit of uh, an idea of how Iranian lives were for women before Reza Shah and what changes he introduced? Well, look, the Iranian women's movement basically started in the 19th century, you know, as, as uh, uh, more and more uh, Iranian men uh, were familiarized themselves with what went on in the West. So they shared it with their, uh, their family, the female in the family. And uh, this, you had families who were educating their daughters to read and to write. There were no schools then. It was, the education was done uh, at home, but, um, in 1905-1906, a revolution took place in Iran, the constitutional revolution. You know, people came out into the street and protested against the autocracy and the autocratic rule of the monarch from the Qajar dynasty. So Muzaffar Din Shah, this, the king then, agreed to become a constitutional monarch. And the, consti the first constitution was drafted in Iran. And women, when men came out into the street and demonstrated, women came out too. And this was the first time that you saw women in large number, large relatively for that period, to come out all covered, you know, clad in the chador and so on covered. And, you know, probably not having an idea of what a constitutional monarchy is going to be, 
but they saw the men, you know, and the clergy and so on. So they followed and they came out into the street. But when the constitution was drafted, women, interestingly enough, alongside the member of the army and people who are not in, I, would, I don't want to use uh, the word insane, but people who were not sane, that's the word divane they used in Persian, were barred from voting and also uh, getting elected to parliament. So basically what happened, they said, thank you very much to contributing to the over uh, to the uh, establishment of the con uh, of the constitution of the constitutional monarchy but now it's time to go back to their to your homes but while this happened there were a number of women educated home educated women who decided this can't go on we need schooling for girls so they started private schools of, in Tehran, Tabriz and Masha. And there are funny stories of that period. For example, the, prince of, the principal of one of the schools in Tabriz in her memoirs wrote that they put a sign outside the elementary school. So which said school for girls, you know, Madrese Dokhtarane. And every night men would come and tear down the sign. And the next morning, these women, the principal would go back to school and some families would dare sending this, their little daughters to the school who put the sign back. So, but over the years, the number of private school grew. But then in 19, fast forward, in 1925, there was a change of dynasty in Iran and Reza Shah became uh, the king. And I think one of his decisions that he took is that you can't have half of the population not literate. So elementary schools and high schools were set up. Plus there was already a teacher training college for women and one for men. So he expanded that teacher uh, college and eventually uh, elementary education became compulsory. So you saw little girls going to school more and more. Parallel to this a group of activist women started women journals, started women association. So this was, and this was done in the early years, in the late years of the old dynasty and the early years of this dynasty. But one of the boldest decision that Reza Shah took was the abolition of the veil. In 1935, 36, he announced that, um, you know, women, there is no need for women to cover themselves. And if the, the, the chador, you know, the long veil was replaced with a European hat. So you have pictures of that period where you see women very ill at ease, you know, wearing this hat and appearing in public. You know, the abolition of the veil, I mean, didn't go well among a substantial number uh, of the population and es especially the clerical community objected to that. But you know, I mean, it was the, the hijab was abolished and it was enforced. And that really the enforcement was done in the street. If a woman went out wearing the chador, the police would tear out the veil. And don't forget that in those days, the veil would also cover the poverty of women. You know, I mean, if you didn't have the means, 
all you have to do is to cover themselves with the chador and go out and so on. So that it was welcomed by the more progressive part of the society and less welcomed by the more traditional society. So uh, when Reza Shah uh, abdicated and left the country, I mean, his son, under his son's reign, Muhammad Reza Shah, this hijab was not enforced. But you saw more and more women not observing the hijab. It was no longer people were, I mean, the police would stop you because you were covering your head. No, women were free to dress as they did. And that made a lot of difference. And one more, uh, uh, I think, uh, biggest achievement under Reza Shah was uh, this uh, inaugurating Tehran University, the first university in Iran. And what was interesting was that it opened to men and women. So there were 11 women among the first class of that university. And one of them tells in her memoirs that the librarian at the university was so shocked to see women. So he put a curtain, he curtained off a part of the classroom of the library so that uh, the men should not see the women. The, of course, I mean, the president of the university found out about it and told him to move the, I mean, to move that curtain. But some of these women remember that the professors in class were very much ill at ease to look women in their uh, face. You know, it was a novelty. Um, but they all have very good memories from that period, you know, when you look at their memoirs, it was fantastic. And under Reza Shah, women started getting employment. So that was another achievement. But he didn't tamper with the personal status law, except raising the age of marriage from nine to 13 for uh, women, and that uh, <clears throat> marriages had to be registered in a notary office. Until then, a cleric would marry you off, and that was enough. You would have the contract. But then they set up notary offices for these marriages to be registered there. Polygamy was still on the law of the land. He himself, I think, either had three wives or four wives. So, you know, that still existed. Um, but then under his son, you know, uh, I think uh, under Muhammad Reza Shah, you had more than one university. So there were many more women going to universities, many more women were employed. Uh, nobody bothered whether you would cover your hair or you would not cover your hair. But uh, one of the and women got the right to vote and to be elected to parliament which was an amazing achievement. And the, and the first group of women who got into parliament were four, but they were among the women activists and known in the country. And the two women were appointed by the king to sit on the Senate. But the biggest achievement I think of that period was happened in 1960. Uh, 67 it was the family protection law, which was then amended in 1975, four years before the revolution. And that was, you know, that really created a revolution among women in, in, in uh, uh, Iran, because the age of marriage was raised from 13 to 15 and eventually for 18 for girls. Um, family protection courts were uh, set up, family courts were set up where women could go and seek a divorce. You know, child custody was given to the mother 
unless the mother remarried, which until then was automatically given to the family of the father, which was very important. Um, women could have access to employment. The husband couldn't stop them from taking an employment or leaving uh, the house and many other advantages that women got through this law. So on the eve of the revolution, um, you had women working both in the public sector and in the private sectors. We had two women uh, minister. One was the minister of education, the other women's minister for women's affairs. Unfortunately, after the revolution, the first woman who was executed was Farrokh Luparsa, who was the minister of education. She was accused of corrupting the girls by the who went to school. What she on the I mean, she was a very distinguished lady. Her mother was a woman activist in the 19th century. Anyway, that's a different story. Wow, so it seems really that even before 1925, early 1900s, that women in Iran already were beginning to take their place in society and to become members of that society. And they moved forward then with Reza Shah to studying with, uh, and then with the king and Mahmoud Reza Shah is actually when that coincided with the period that you were living in Iran and where you had also a lot to do with the women's organization. Is there anything from your own experiences in the women's organization that comes to mind as, as uh, being particularly interesting? Look, the women's organization in Iran had a secretary general, Mahnaz Afghani, who just actually finished, lives in Washington and finished her memoirs. And I, I really, I recommend that you should look at her book. I mean, she was young. She was a young woman who had finished her studies in the US, came back with all these new ideas, came back to Iran. And uh, she modernized the women's organization of Iran and employed a group of like-minded young women, you know, to help her, to work with her. And that's, and I was one of them. And that's when, you know, there was an excitement then that, you know, women are going to vote. Women are going to be the parliament. Women are going to become ministers. Women are going, women are going to become deputy ministers. Women were running private businesses, you know. Um, when I used to travel a lot around Iran to visit the family, uh, the women's organization branches in Iran. And you would see little girls of five or six walking from one village to another village and to, to go to school. And I remember, you know, talking to their mothers and they would say, look, we don't know how to read and write, but we want our daughters to be able to go to university, Donishka. I mean, they wouldn't settle for less. They wanted their daughters to have a profession, you know. So you and uh, the women's organization in the less affluent part of the city had centers, you know, the providing daycare for women who had to go to work. And it was very interesting. I remember at first, the mothers would come and bring their sons and not their daughters. For them, the lit this little boy should go to the daycare center, but the girl should stay some with somebody at home at all. So we tried to convince them, you know, that the, the boy has other opportunities. Bring your girl, little girls to these daycare centers. We also had at these um, family planning, sorry, family uh, vocational training centers, 
we taught women different vocations, you know, which was very important. Even if it was, we would provide them with a sewing machine, get somebody to teach them how to sew, to embroider, anything that would create an earning for them. So, you know, so that I think looking back, I think those years that the women's organization was very much active and involved made a, played an important role uh, before the revolution for emancipating these women. That sounds really excellent. But I imagine that the clerics were not very happy with what you were doing. Is that right? Well, I don't think they had a lot of choice because their own daughters were going to school too. You know, so no, I don't think they were. They were never happy with how emancipated women were. And actually, when the family uh, protection uh, law was drafted, the then Minister of uh, Justice, Javad de Sadr, took the text and went to uh, Najaf in uh, Iraq and discussed it with the then Ayatollah there and got his uh, okay and uh, he, he spent a, a day or two. I read it in his memoirs and brought the text and then submitted submitted it to parliament, you know. All right. Okay. And this is Ayatollah Khomeini who had been deported. No, by... not nothing to do with Ayatollah. Oh. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. The marja, the center, this uh, person, you know, the, the Shiite religion have the top ranking Ayatollah. In the 70s, it was not Ayatollah Khomeini and he never was a Marja in Iraq. No, he was he was in exile in Iraq. He was and, exiled in Iraq, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he never even saw the, the text. That's right. one, one of the first decision after the revolution was uh, suspending the family protection law. So exactly. So with that, that's what, what we're going to move on to in a minute. Uh, so, of course, this, this all paints a very good picture for the progress of women in Iran in during the reign of uh, uh, Mahmoud Reza Shah. But with the prosperity that was coming to the country, there was more and more a difference between rich and poor. There was more and more a rise of the intellectual middle classes. And little bit by little bit, people began, of course, the, to, re, to, re, to demand and to request the things that actually people are asking for now, which is freedom, uh, freedom of speech, freedom, uh, dignity, equality. And uh, finally, in the late 70s, of course, there was the uh, unrest in the country. And in 1979, we had the revolution. And there came the Islamic uh, revolution with Ayatollah Khomeini coming back. And a lot of people at the time, of course, left the country to see how this revolution would pan out. But the majority of people were in favor of the, of, of, of the Ayatollah and the Islamic revolution. And the interesting thing is that that was women uh, at just as much as men. And why why do you believe why would you think that women also supported this uh, revolution um uh, I'll, I'll take that but look i have to say that before the revolution i lived in iran and i worked in iran and um i think the country was doing economically very well and no comparison with the uh, um, you know, the, the existing uh, distances between the rich and the poor. I mean, I, as I said, I used to travel a lot inside Iran. When it came to economic issues, I mean, across the board, everybody was beneficiary. But politically, no, you are right. I mean, politically, the uh, regime was not a democratic regime. I mean, uh, and of course there was um, unhappiness 
by the political pressure and the lack of, uh, uh, I mean, everything I'm saying is relative, uh, lack of uh, freedom and democratic aspiration. And of course the intellectuals and the universities want to have democratic aspirations. Mm -hmm. This was on the one hand. On the other hand, the country was being westernized very fast. And for the more conservative classes in Iran, their westernization was much too fast, you know. And the, the westernization was, in, was also affecting their own families, their own children, their daughters, their son were no longer thinking in the traditional way they were they were drinking uh, thinking in the modern way and when the first demonstration started um women you know from all classes educated women uh, working class women workers of government officials women, they all participated in the marches. And I remember talking with some of them in the early days of the revolution when they were uh, going to these marches and coming, and they always thought that, you know, the Islamic revolution, they will not Islamize the country. On the contrary, they thought that the Islamic revolution will democratize the country, you see? So it was with this aspiration, with this hope that the women joined uh, these marches, joined in the movement to overthrow the monarchy, thinking that, you know, this, the new system, whatever it's going to be, will expand their rights, not contract it. But they were in for a big surprise because, you know, this was a revolution that the leader was a cleric and the foot soldiers on the ground were mosques and also cleric. And they had their own agenda, you know, and if you wanted to stay in Iran, you had to follow the new legislations, the new rules and so on. And women suddenly, I think it didn't take long to find out that they had lost a lot of their rights. As I said earlier, the family protection law was suspended. So women lost all their rights. The age of marriage was reduced to nine. It took 10 years to raise it to 13, uh, you know, and this doesn't mean that every 13 year old girl is married off in Iran. On the contrary, the mean age of marriage, I think is 21 in Iran. You have more educated, you have more girls entering the universities than boys. You know, it was so funny a couple of years ago, Parliament was toying with the idea to introduce a quota system in favor of men entering universities. Usually the quota system is for women, but that is a, and women are very savvy and uh, you know they 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 are achievers, and that's why they didn't want to be delegated to second class citizens. Right. You know, when the constitution of the Islamic Republic was drafted, you know, um, there was one woman in the constitutional assembly and then only four uh, articles in the constitution deal with the role of women, but it always says that it has to be within the tenet of Islam. So that was, you know, that was made clear, but women kept their political rights. Women could uh, 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 vote and could elect, uh, could be elected to parliament. Women could vote in city councils and be member of city councils. But in the 43 years of the life of the Islamic Republic, you had one minister, 
Minister of Health under President Ahmadinejad. And after two years, I think he sacked her for whatever reason. But uh, different presidents over the last four, three, three years have appointed I, from one to four vice presidents dealing with different issues, including one for family, women and family. Right. Uh, so, so, you know, I mean, the Islamic Republic has not been too friendly with, uh, the, with women. And therefore, what you see happening now is the culmination of all the, I think, uh, discrimination that women have suffered in the last 43 years. Right. Right. And you, of course, went back um, it, several times from the States and you wrote, you in, interviewed several women, tens of women about their lives in Iran. And I just, I mean, I'll just take one of the quotes from one of the women just to get an idea. Uh, you have a lady called Gohar who was saying, I was a judge. I presided over a court. But after the revolution, when women could no longer become judges, I was demoted to the rank of legal assistant. It's like removing the president of a university and making her a janitor. I mean, that really kind of brings it home as to what, what rights women uh, did lose under, um, under this regime and which they are fighting for. And of course, the women who are fighting at the moment are not the ladies that you interviewed who were already there before the revolution, but rather the children of the revolution. And they are, they are willing to put their lives down for freedom of choice and for equality, which is incredible what they're doing. But of course, as you said, there have been 300 deaths, hundreds uh, and hundreds, uh, no, a few hundred, uh, sorry? Thousands of arrests, thousands of- Thousands of arrests, indeed, <laughs> thousands of arrests. And, and th this is the very interesting point is that of course, these people are not going to get any justice and who knows that better than you, who's already had a taste of what the justice of the Islamic revolution could was. Um, you were you you came home to visit your mother, and you were unceremoniously arrested and then put under home arrest for sorry under country arrest for eight months, and of that time, one hundred and five days, just over three months you were put into uh, the dreaded Evin uh, prison in Tehran. And this was all without a trial and also with the backing of people of the highest authority in Iran and outside of it, the connections that you had. I mean, even uh, Senator Barack Obama at the time was calling for, for, your, uh, for them to let you go. And they still had very little clout uh, until the until the government decided to luckily to let you go. Do, it, uh, would you be comfortable very briefly to tell us how that felt to be part of that, uh, to be in that situation? Uh, you want me to talk about the prison or the release? Which one? <laughs> no. The prison, mostly, mostly okay. because, or rather, the injustice of the system and how you felt, because that is, of course, what so many of the women today are feeling. Um, look, Evin is known as the one of the most notorious prisons in the world. So, um, when they told me they are taking me to prison after five months of interrogation outside prison, um, I knew where they were going to take me. I'm a student of Iran, so I was quite familiar 
you know, from reading what Evin was like. And I wasn't sure whether I would come out alive or whether I would be sentenced to life or to 20 years and so on. I did, and because they were constantly threatening me with, uh, we will keep you as long as it is necessary. And I was also concerned because a couple of years earlier, they had just killed a Canadian Iranian journalist by hitting her on the head during her interrogation. She just died in prison. So, you know, I was familiar with all that. And of course, I mean, if I tell you no, I couldn't care less, that's not true. I mean, I was, I was there, I was in solitary confinement. I mean, it was a small room and the door was locked from the outside. And every time that uh, iron door banged, I, I would just jump, it was boomerang, boomerang in my head. So all these things. But on the, on the other hand, I think that once you are in prison, you, or at least I think I decided that I'm not going to play their game, you know? So I was, I mean, any question they asked, I would answer them and then go back in my, uh, in my room and then in my cell and start repeating the question and answering my mind. So they would love, they were good at catching you in discrepancy, you know, and say, well, okay, you said that the other day you are saying this year. I mean, you know, it was hard. I, my companions were either my interrogators or the women guards who, you know, would bring in your breakfast or your and your lunch and uh, dinner and only uh, they would let you out for an hour walking on the terrace. And for those of you who are familiar with August in Iran, you can imagine how two o'clock in the afternoon, how warm, how hot it was. But I would always welcome it and go out, you know. And um, sometimes they would, uh, I mean, on the average, it was eight hours of interrogation, the same subject going over and over and over again. My conclusion was that um, they were very concerned about the Velvet Revolution that had happened in the countries of the former Soviet Union. They thought that if there is going to be a, a de if there will be demonstrations or strikes and so on, it might lead to that. So they were con they thought that I'm privy to what the United States is planning for Iran. And it took, I don't know whether at the end also I was able to convince them that the last thing I know is what the United States is planning uh, for Iran. You know, they also were, in those days, they were very worried about women. They thought if women come out in the street, how would they deal with it? That was also a big question to them. It was a terrible time, horrible time, the pressure, the mental harassment was extraordinary. Just to tell you, I lost 20 pounds in three months. So, I mean, to see- And you don't uh, weigh very much, do you? No, no. <laughs> and I slept on the floor. I just had one trador to put on the floor and, and one to cover myself. And that was it. There was no mattress, no bed, and so on. So it was a tough time, very tough time. And it stays with you. Do I have nightmares? No, I'm a very tough person. But does it stay with me? Yes. The other night, when um, there was a fire at Evin, my first thought was for the inmates, because I thought the guards would probably try and escape. I mean, there is a fire. They are not going to go and open uh, cell by cell and let the inmates out. What is going to happen to them? And 
I have close friends in still in Edin, you know, who have been there for seven years, 10 years, you know, and uh, so I was very worried about them. You know, that, that's it. I mean, it one certainly of did bring it home when as I was rereading your book, My Prison, My Home, and at the same time, Evin was on fire. It really brings it home to think, my goodness, and nobody knows how many people are there, what situation. And there's, of course, no sense of justice for anybody. It's just anything goes at the moment, isn't it? Yes. I mean, you know, I, I just worry that they will go, they are going to have this mass trial and they have started already and they will convict these uh, prisoners, some to death will execute them and others to long-term prison. So I think, I mean, in the outside, the outside world has to try and delegitimize these uh, courts, which are not acceptable anywhere around the world with no lawyers, nothing. So I'm very concerned about them. I'm very worried about the prison. Mm. Mm. Oh, we're really, really pleased that you came out uh, of that hellhole, basically, in one piece, and, and you can talk to us now. We, uh, we hope that, uh, that the same fate will, will happen to a lot of the people there, but uh, it looks like the government is not going down without a huge big fight. <coughs> so one thing is very clear. The genie of discontent has come out of the bottle. And I'm looking at some of the questions that people are asking. They want to know what you think about the future. Um, how do you see the future of Iran at the moment? Well, look, I really, uh, I, I don't know, honestly. The honest answer is, I don't know where we are going. I mean, there is a difference between what I want for Iran, what I hope for Iran, but the last eight weeks have shown that you have a generation that is not scared. You have a generation that is using this opportunity to express their wishes, what they want, they want fundamental change, maybe, I mean, regime change, you know. But on the other hand, you have a government that is not seeing it or does not want to admit what goes on. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine, he, uh, he said that, well, I think the government is in La La Land. And I used it as a headline for an article I wrote. And I think the, there is such a big rift between what these young people want and what the government wants. I just don't know. I, and I don't want to speculate. I mean, speculation is not my forte, really. <laughs> Well, I, let's hope for the best. Yes, they're not going to go down, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. They're not going to go down without a huge big fight. And, and that happened again with the previous rev. Every revolution has its, its moments of, of bloodshed. And we don't know how this one is going to end. But uh, we wish them we wish them all the best in any event. I think everybody here is wishing all the women strength. And um, there we're almost at the end of our session. Um, we had a few uh, questions as um, in the panel. Uh, we know you've answered a few of those with about the future of the country and about the future of the women and uh, the differences. There's one question that is talking about the differences between the rural areas and the cities in Iran. And I think that is maybe something that is also on people's minds that there is this huge big uh, movement from women 
but is that also what the majority of rural people of 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 yeah, of Islamic believers do you think that they are also behind this movement? Well, I would like to think that they are also behind the, this movement, but maybe not participating. We don't know what we, but we know that in small towns, there, where, wherever there is a university, there has been demonstrations, you know, and, uh, uh, but don't forget that a lot of these young women and young men are also coming from the rural areas. They come to cities, go to university. You see, for example, Massa Amini, who started the whole, whose death triggered everything. She was living in Sarkez, a small town in Iranian Kurdistan, but was going to start university in the city of Yaz this far. You see, so, so they, there is this movement. I mean, something has changed in Iran. You have now 80 million, over 80 million is the population. And there are schools in the rural area. And don't forget, there are satellite dishes in the rural areas too. So they watch, they are connected. At the, you know, the last time, 14 years ago, after my imprisonment, uh, when I used to, before that, when I used to go to Iran and go to these, go to some villages and travel just to see what is going on and so on, you would see everybody with an iPhone, a, a, a cell phone. So, so the cell phone connects the rural areas of Iran with the rest of the country. And wow. these young people watch, watch the same movies, the same news, the same uh, Twitter, the same Instagram that people in the city love. So yeah. maybe we don't see ye as yet the bazaar or all the factories going on strike, coming out for a long, uh, for a, a week, two weeks, three weeks to support them. But I'm sure if there is going to be a change, they will be part of it. Right, right. Yeah. So really, the, what we're seeing today is somebody who's also asked us what was the difference between 2000, between now and 2009 revolutions. And basically, it is that uh, it, it's all over the country. It's across all of the, uh, it's across all of the uh, strata of, of, of the country, of the people. And uh, it, it just, we've never seen this kind of We've never seen this kind of demonstration. It is, of course, when the women rule and when the women <laughs> let their voices be known, things change. So Khale, I thank you very much for uh, all the information that you have given us tonight and everything that you have told us about the women's organization. I would um, really like to uh, thank you, especially for everything that you have been through for sharing all of that. And you, uh, like so many other Iranian uh, Iranians in the diaspora, and also very, very uh, a new phenomena as so many Westerners, non-Iranian Westerners, are supporting this movement, something we have not seen in the last 44 years. It is absolutely, uh, uh, yeah, mind-boggling to see how for in concerts and everywhere that this uh, movement is being supported. So you, I want to thank very much. And if our uh, audience still has a few minutes, we would like to play for you a translation of the anth of a song that has become the anthem of this movement, a song called Baraye or Four by Sherveen um, Hajipur. And this is the English translation of that song, which was played in the voice of, uh, uh, in the voice in Germany. And uh, with that, again, I thank you 
uh, Hale, and I thank everybody who's uh, joined us. And I'm sure we've all learned a lot more about this revolution. And let's hope that it will lead to better places. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And sorry we didn't get to have the Q&A, but you can always contact me at the Wilson Center. We did actually. I have actually gone through almost all of the questions that were that were here one way or another. Maybe not every single thank one. Thank you very much and thank you to Sita. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Esman Bieri. And Steve, uh, if I could ask you please to now let us, uh, go with this nice song of the revolution. Well,